prayer. The concept of prayer. You might think, that's so easy. It's so basic. There's really nothing much to it. It's just talking. It's just speaking to God. Well, over the next four weeks, I think you'll come to realize that in four weeks, there's not even enough time in four weeks to talk about all there is to talk about, about prayer. Yes, it seems very simple. Yes, it seems rather basic. It's rather just fundamental of attending church, if you like. But what we'll see is that prayer in itself is very complex. Indeed, there are many, there's many layers that go into prayer to make it what it is and what it's about and what it does and what it doesn't do. It's quite incredible. So over the next four weeks, by the end of it, you'll probably have a PhD in prayer. And I'll give you a certificate, perhaps, if you attend every session. But even four weeks, like I said, isn't enough to do this subject or this topic the justice that it deserves. But I hope this morning, at least, as we introduce it, even this morning's session, you'll see things that perhaps you haven't seen before. Or at least be refreshed by things about prayer that will just really speak to your heart and by the end of it, by the end of uh, uh, four weeks, and I'll, I'll speak a few times, and Pastor Irwin will speak a few times. I pray that we can really take it to heart that we become more of a praying church, a praying people, because at the end of the day, we can't, we can't have too much prayer. There can never be too much of prayer. Our problem, probably particularly living in cities, with the busyness and the stress and the, the traffic and the travel and time is that we probably have too little of prayer. We don't have enough of it as what we probably desire to have. But I'm sure that as you spend more time in prayer and when you do it, you'll go away thinking that was worthwhile. That was a blessing. Now I know why so many great people of old, great Christians, spend a lot of time in prayer. Because you see the fruits of it. You'll see the benefits of it as, as we do it more and more and becomes more and more part of who we are and what we do. So let's open up with Matthew chapter 6 if you haven't done so already. This will be our key text for this morning, but I'll go to Luke as a means of introduction to prayer. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them. For your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. And he goes on. Let's pause and let's pray. No use preaching about prayer if we don't pray. <laughs> Father God, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us all here together this morning. We thank you, Lord, that when we are together, even this morning, we have that sense of being in a revival. Lord, that our hearts are encouraged, we are filled with the joy of being together. We thank you, Lord, that 
You have said, when two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So Lord, we thank you this morning that your presence is here with us, because you are there where your people gather. And Father, Lord, I pray, as we think about prayer this morning, and we begin this short series, I pray, Lord, that you would really speak to our hearts and to our minds, and to encourage us and to strengthen our resolve to be people of prayer, even as Jesus was a man of prayer too. And Father, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that uh, you be with our, our Sunday school teachers, be with our creche uh, ministry, Lord, be with the children, and bless them, Lord, and draw them, each and every one of them, to yourself. And Lord, we don't pray, Lord, just for ourselves, but we pray for our other faithful churches that are gathering in this nation this morning. And we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen your people wherever they are gathered this morning. And Lord, we pray for Pastor Irwin and Adeline, Lord. Pray, Lord, that you continue to bless their time in Sydney as they're with the family and celebrating the birthday of Pastor Irwin's mum. I pray, Lord, that you use them to be an encouragement to the family and to the church over there and bring them home safely in the next couple of days. So Father, just pray now, Lord, for your spirit to minister to our hearts. And Lord, that it wouldn't be just my voice that we're here this morning, but to pray, Lord, that we'd hear you, you speaking to us in a very personal way and uh, speaking to us for our need of prayer. And Lord, and above all things, just hide me in the shadow of your cross. Lord, that we would see your light and your glory. And uh, Lord, that from this place today, we go away rejoicing, having known that we have met with you even this morning. So Lord, bless us now as we open up your word, open up our hearts, open up our mind, open up our eyes. So Lord, that we can see, take away the blindness. Lord, help us to see things that we haven't seen before in your precious word. We ask these things, Lord, for your glory. And Lord, for that you would be the, the strength and the shepherd of your people. And lead us beside the still waters. But lead us into the green pastures and nourish us and feed our hearts and our souls now. For we ask and we pray these things. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Looking at Luke chapter 11, verse 1. If you would turn with me there. Hold your place in Matthew. We'll come back to that in a moment. But Jesus has this conversation with one of his disciples. Not all of them, but one of them. And in verse 1 of chapter 11, it reads this. Now it came to pass, as he was praying, that as, as Jesus was praying, in a certain place, when he ceased, or when he stopped, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Lord, teach us to pray, even as John taught his disciples. I want us to think about prayer in terms of a means of communication. It is that divine uh, form of, of speak, if you like, that God has ordained by means that we can communicate with God. And it's called prayer. It is like a conversation. In its very simple sense, it is communication. And what do you think about communication? What comes to mind? Because this is going to be important because you begin to unravel, unpack what prayer really is. Prayer is ought not to be a burden. Prayer is not a waste of time. Prayer is not a sense of, I have to do this because I'm expected to do it. There are all negative connotations or connections with prayer. But when we really unravel it, we think, what really is prayer? Prayer is a form of communication. Do you love to talk? Do you love to meet up with a friend and have a good chinwag? 
catching up. What you been up to lately? Hey, I haven't seen you for a week or two. Hey, what happened to this? Hey, have you heard about this other person? Well, some people even like to gossip. That's communication too. That's a sinful communication in the Bible, but nevertheless, nevertheless it's just speaking because people just love to talk. Probably by the end of this message, you'd be saying, Michael, you can stop talking now. We've had enough. That's natural, isn't it? Too much of a good thing sometimes. Uh, <laughs> A prayer. Just simple talking, speaking. And what we have in this verse 1, just to introduce the concept, we look at the next slide. We've got three key points. We have a disciple of prayer. There is one disciple mentioned in this verse that approaches Jesus. He has a desire to know about prayer. And he's talking to the director of prayer, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The director who gives direction. And that's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to give direction to this disciple to fulfill his desire. Now you and I as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I can put ourselves in the same situation. Let's check our heart this morning and check our desires. Do I desire to pray? Well, to pray and to have a desire, you need a reason. And if that reason is strong enough, yes, you will pray. I put it to you this morning that most people in the world are praying people at some time or another. Think about this for a moment. Someone who is sick in bed, maybe they've got a bad disease. Maybe they know that their time is, is running short in this life. It's a time to pray, isn't it? They probably pray more than they, any other time in their life. But at some point, they're probably going to pray. Think about the students that are outside the auditorium before they go into the maths exam. You think the students are maths exam? Do you think there's prayer in schools today? Oh Lord, please, if you're out there, please let me pass. Oh, I want to get to med school. I want to be a doctor. I want to be an accountant. Oh, I've got to please my parents. Oh, please, if you're out there, hear me. I want to pass this exam. Oh, yeah, you sure? There's, there's prayer in schools today. Prayer in universities. Prayer at work. People, believe it or not, are praying people when there is a reason. When there's strong enough desire and motivation is there, people will pray. And that's the unfortunate thing about prayer is often it's too little, too late. Exactly. We pray when there's an emergency. We pray when we urgently want something or the circumstances are, are too big for us, they're out of our control. We look to someone who is bigger and greater and higher than us. Then we start to exercise prayer, this form of communication. The disciple of prayer, the desire for prayer, getting coaching from the director of prayer. Just one of his disciples. And when he approaches the Lord, he says, or what he doesn't say, he doesn't say, Lord, teach us to preach. He doesn't say, Lord, teach us how to do miracles, how to heal the sick. How to raise the dead. I mean, that would be a normal thing, I think, for a disciple to really want to know. Wouldn't you think? Because they are the grandiose things of ministry. They are the ones that draw the crowds. They are the ones that, that, that's the type of ministry that bring a pat on the back and say, Oh, you're amazing. How would you do that? He doesn't say those. He doesn't have that kind of request. But his request to the Master was, Lord, teach us. Teach us to pray. Beautifully, prayer is communication. And you know this word communication is based on a word common. Communication, communication, common. Some of you may have experienced in your lifetime communism, where the political ideology is to have all things in common. We all live in a common unity, 
a community. So communication, something that which is common, something which is common is, is knowable and it's easily recognisable. And in this case, it's language. Language is the common communication language. And language is an audible means by which ideas and information is transmitted between two or more receivers. It's hard to have a communication with yourself, wouldn't you think? Well, let's be honest, some of the best conversations are with yourself sometimes during the day, aren't they? Because nobody else is, is listening. You talk to yourself. <laughs> But communication usually is between two or more receivers. And we commonly call this communication speaking. And when all this is working properly, the language is common, the ideas and information is being transmitted freely through the means of speaking. When all that is working properly, the result is connection. Connection. Think about that about prayer. Making a connection with God by a means of communicating a common form of language to a receiver and you are a receiver. When all that's working well, there is connection. What so often happens in our life, perhaps in our family, sometimes in our workplace, you know this, what will happen. What happens when the communication breaks down? Something happens at work in the workplace and someone gets the blame and says, well, so-and-so never told me. Somebody never communicated with me. The assignments do. The teacher didn't tell me when the assignment was due. They didn't communicate. Communication breakdown. The connection is broken down. The connection is lost. How much more so when we don't pray? When we don't communicate, when we don't speak to God, the connection will be lost. The connection then needs to be built back up again. You know, but there's also communication language, which is common, which is not necessarily audible. You can't hear it. But nevertheless, it is still common and still results in connection. There is body language, for example. I don't have to say anything, but you know exactly what I'm saying. I am communicating that form of language. What about there is sign language? Don't have to say anything. Just give the sign. And know exactly what the person is saying. You exactly know the language, it is common, it is knowable, and just by that, a connection is made. Understanding. So these things, there's even computer language. If you want to talk to a computer, you need to know the language. How about this? How about this book? Communication. A book. From outside our time domain, God has written this book. He writes about things that haven't happened yet because he knows in advance what will be as he's ordained. He's communicating his ideas and his thoughts, his message, his meeting, uh, meaning it's already written down in this form of communication. It's not audible. You can't hear it, but it speaks when you read it. Powerful, powerful communication. So is prayer. Prayer is very, very powerful. This word of God, this form of God's communication. I'd have to say there's nothing more reliable in a form of communication than this book. Nothing more reliable. Why? Because it's been in existence for hundreds of years. People have tried to disprove it. People have tried to get rid of it. People have tried to burn it. But it's still here. It won't go away. Powerful communication. A message that simply won't be moved away. 
Wow. Is this Bible then, let me ask, put you like this. Is this communication from God, is it commonly knowable and recognizable? That's the question. Think about it for a moment. Is the Word of God, the message from God, this communication in written form, is it commonly knowable and recognizable as a means of communication? This is one of those questions that whatever answer you tell me, you're going to be wrong. <laughs> I hate those kind of questions. If I say this, you know he's going to say this. And if I say this, he's going to say this. What do you think? The answer I'd say is no, it's not. It's not commonly knowable and recognizable as a means of communication. It's very accessible. There's thousands, hundreds of thousands of these books in the world. They're everywhere. But it's a means of communication that is not common and knowable, easily recognizable. How can I back that up with Scripture? Let's look at the next slide in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit, as the Holy Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. And you put that into the context of what the Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthians is that things like, by the wisdom of man, it was, God was not known. By the, by the spirit of man, he is not able to understand the things that are of God. That's the context in these verses. And so what we're saying here, what the Apostle Paul is saying here, is that the very communication of God, His very Word, is not commonly knowable and recognizable except by that Spirit. Without that Spirit, the Holy Spirit making it possible, it wouldn't be understood. Therefore, the communication is only going to fall on deaf ears. Little wonder Jesus said, Them that have ears to hear, let them hear. It's only that communication made recognizable and knowable to us by the Holy Spirit. So now we get introduced to a, the need of an agent. There is a third party that needs to be involved in our communication, the communication from God and the communication with God. That third party, that agent is the Spirit of God. Without Him, we wouldn't be able to know the things of God. Without Him, we, in other words, we don't understand what God is communicating to us. The natural man receiveth not the things of God. The natural man. He must be a man that is not natural, but supernatural, empowered by the Holy Spirit. So I need to ask you this morning, do you have the Holy Spirit this morning? Because if you don't, you won't understand the things that God is trying to tell you. Because the Bible says, Corinthians says, the things of God are spiritually discerned. Not in the power and the strength of the flesh, but by the Spirit they can be discerned. That is, they can be known to us, recognizable, and therefore becoming common in the communication. And then we start introducing this concept that most of you will be familiar with, praying in the Spirit. To pray in the Spirit. And I'm not going to talk about it this morning, but I'm just going to plant that seed in your mind. And over the next coming weeks, you will understand that we need the Spirit to be able to communicate with God. Hence, praying in the Spirit, as opposed to praying in myself or in my own strength of the flesh. Let's leave it there, otherwise I'll be talking about another message. So when the disciple says, Lord, teach us to pray, in the very real sense he is saying this, Lord, very specific, 
who he's talking to, who he's asking the request. He's saying, Lord, you. Not Bob or Sally. No, you, Lord. You teach us how to communicate with God the Father. And in his heart, he's got this question. What is the common language of prayer that I need to know, something that I'm missing, so that I can connect with God through speaking a language that is common to both of us, to God and myself, that we both can understand. And speaking in the way that you, Jesus, connect with God the Father. What is that common language of prayer? That I can connect with God in a way which I can understand and we can understand each other just like the way that you, Jesus, connect with the Father. That's what he's asking when he says, Lord, you teach us how to pray. Who taught you how to pray? Who taught you how to pray? Or let me back up a bit. Has anybody taught you how to pray ever? Hmm. Well, yeah, okay. A few shakes of the head. No, not really. Not. Well, I, I, I just copied somebody else and I started modeling my prayer off of Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so and I thought they were a really godly person so I sort of just worked it out myself. Hmm. Has any one of us stopped to ask the Lord, Lord, teach me how to pray? Has anyone? I want to learn from you, Lord, how do I really connect with God the Father in the way that you connect with God the Father. How do you do that? I have some basic ideas and some basic principles, but I always seem to feel that my prayers never seem to get any further than that ceiling. You know, they just hit the ceiling and bounce back down at me and I try again. I don't seem to be getting anywhere. I don't seem to be making any progress into, into the depths of the very realm of God. So Lord, teach me how to pray. Why might this have been the request of this disciple to learn how to pray? Not to preach, not to do miracles like Jesus did. You know what? I like the heart of this man. I like it in the sense, I like his thinking. You see, if one knows how to pray, <coughs> preaching and miracles are the easy part. It's prayer. And just about every time, prayer proves to be the most challenging thing to do. The depth of prayer in itself is not easy. No wonder we need a third party involved. No wonder we need an agent of God. No wonder it says in Romans 8 that we do not pray as we ought to pray, but the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings and utterings that cannot be heard. A very important ministry then of the Holy Spirit is intercessory prayer for us. Because we don't pray as we we don't know what to pray as we ought. We don't pray as we ought to pray. We need God involved. Therefore, that's why I'm saying for us. The thing to take away and do from this message is to go home and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, you teach me how to pray. I want to be taught by the Master who really knew how to pray. Because I want to be able to know and I want to be able to see and I want to be effective like Jesus was. He was just the living example for us. And we copy his example. So, Whatever follows after prayer. I'll tell you this. When Jesus finishes praying on any particular day, you can virtually guarantee that for the rest of the day, things got very interesting. Some pretty amazing things happened. But prayer, communication, time with God, the Father was first. 
whatever 